So what are we trying to do in this series? Nobody's asked me this, but I thought, well, I should at least tell you, why in the world are we studying this? Because we typically study books of the Bible and we will do that next. Uh, and we'll talk about applying that into our world and our lives. But there are two purposes in this lesson. The first is to understand the world views that are shaping the events around us. Christians are like everyone else in the sense that when we see turmoil, strife, double standards, things that don't seem right, actions that we don't understand, like every other human being, they can frustrate us or make us anxious or whatever. We have an emotional reaction to things in our world just like everyone else. The Bible talks a lot about being wise in the ways of the world. This great little passage in First Chronicles I put on here, it's, it's a little excerpt out of a list, but talking about the men of Issachar, that's one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and talking about how they understood the times and knew what to do. So one of our goals is to understand how people think in this world, some of the key world views that are shaping events. Not how everyone thinks, not every esoteric worldview, but some of the key worldviews. And I'd like to talk about the Christian worldview, a couple of flavors of the Marxist worldview, because that's also religious in my view, uh, we'll talk in our next lesson about Judaism and Islam over the next couple of lessons. And these things are shaping a lot of events in the world today. Second purpose is to, gr to get greater clarity. So we want understanding and clarity. Sometimes it helps us understand with some sharpness what we believe by looking and comparing to what other people believe. That doesn't have to involve a, we're better than you, but there is such a thing as true and untrue and right and wrong, at least in the Christian story. And so the point is it helps to put a contrast, helps us to understand more clearly, what do we believe? So those are the two reasons that we're doing this. So let me tell you some words I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use the, the word ideology, worldview, religion and story, life story or world story or narrative. I don't like the word narrative or meta-narrative. Uh, it's, just a, it's just got too many postmodern asso uh, associations with it, but that's fine. If you like it, use it. But all of those I'm gonna use in a very interchangeable way. And what I mean by it is, my contention is we all make sense of our world and our lives. There are inevitable questions that every human being in all of time has asked themselves, and that is, who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And why in the world is the Wi-Fi not very good in this building? You know, so there are just certain questions humans have always asked themselves. And we make sense of our world through the stories we tell ourselves, the ideologies, the belief systems, and uh, what I'm gonna to talk to you about, this secular worldview that's fundamentally Marxist in its foundations, and I don't mean that as a pejorative. All I mean by that is I'm just describing what it is, actually is. All those things are belief systems, they're religions. So I'm gonna use all those words kind of interchangeably. Now some stories or worldviews are true, some are mythical, meaning they have elements of truth, but fundamentally they don't comport with reality. And sooner or later, they come head to head with reality. And I'll give you an example of one of those in this lesson. And then some stories are intentionally untrue and that's what we call lies. So you have stories that are true, you have stories that are mythical, and then you have stories that are lies. And we're going to talk about stories that people believe to be true and as observers of world events, we're going to evaluate those. I don't know about you, many of you may have been Christians from a young age or later. I became a Christian a little bit later in life. I grew up as a heathen, I mean completely pagan. And I started looking for what is going to make sense of my life. I remember distinctly having that thought in my later teens. It's like there's so many different ways you can look at life and I wanna know which one am I going to adopt. And so I went out looking for what is the way of looking at life, what's the story, if you will, that's true. And so we're gonna go on a survey of certain worldviews or stories in this lesson. So I wanna recap the Christian story 
and the modern secular worldview called Marxism. Before I do, let's see if we have any carryover questions. Yes, um, we know that communism and Marxism are threats to the Christian church. Is socialism an equal threat? Uh, the question had to do with socialism and communism and their interaction with the Christian story. And I'll, I'll just put a time out on that because that's exactly what I wanna talk about. Once we do the recap, I actually wanna talk about the economic implications of the Marxist story and I'll, I'll, we'll define socialism and communism and contrast them. So thank you, that's a good question and I will get to it. Will you please speak to the difference between equity and equality? Uh, speaking to the difference between equity and equality, I mentioned it briefly last time, and what, I'm, I, I, what I wanna tell you is how are those two words used? In other words, what is their connotation in our society? In our society, when you hear people talk about equality, what they typically mean is are people being given equal opportunities? It's also, uh, synonymous with the idea of what most people mean when they say fairness. Is it a fair justice system? Is it a fair society? I hate that word because there's no such thing as fair, but that's what most people are talking about is the idea of equality, fairness. Is everybody treated about the same? Equity, what most people mean by that, that's a very loaded word, but equity means equal outcomes. And here's the great fallacy and all kinds of people of all kinds of different worldviews use this. There is no doubt there is inequity. Let's just talk about America for a moment. This isn't unique to America and it isn't even unique to the 21st century. But there is no doubt it is a matter of fact that there are inequities in America. There are differences in outcome for different people. By the way, that's true everywhere in the world. The reasoning then, and this is fallacious, this is atrocious reasoning, is that because there are inequities, there is inequality. That might be true, but that needs to be demonstrated. Does that make sense? Those are not the same thing. So the fact that you have inequity, you have differences in outcome, some people make more money than other people. Some people uh, have more power in society than others in this area or in that area. Some people live in nicer houses. I mean, in whatever way you're measuring, there is inequity in any way. Some people are better looking than other people. Some people can run faster than other people. There, there is inequity. What some people are gonna wanna imply is that means there is inequality, meaning people are not being treated fairly and I'll just tell you, that could be true, but that is not obvious, and one does not follow from another. If you were to say to me, Terry, I think there is inequity in your ability to play in the NBA. In other words, I'm not tall enough, I'm not fast enough, and I don't shoot well enough. Let's just stop there. So in other words, there's inequity, right? But I wanna say, that is because there's prejudice. There's inequality. I'm not being given a fair shot. Well, you understand what I'm saying is ludicrous. Inequity and inequality aren't always the same thing, are they? So that's a long-winded answer, but it's something you're gonna hear a lot about. And I just wanna warn you about that fallacy. They could be the same thing, but they don't have to be the same thing. In fact, they're often not the same thing. So you, you'll just see a lot of sleight of hand and again, this is by a lot of people. They'll point out an inequity and say, guess what? There are not very many pastors in the NBA, therefore the NBA is discriminating against pastors. Like, are you serious? That, that is not a logical train of thought. So that's equality and equity as it's commonly used in America, okay? Well, let's go back and talk about the two stories we know. Let's talk about the Christian story. I just wanna summarize it. 
Here's the basic Christian story. I'm leaving out a lot of details, of course. The basic Christian story is that God created us in his image. So there is a God, there is something beyond what you see in this world. I mean, there are a lot of implications of this. We are unique and valuable as individuals. That is a fundamental part that is non-negotiable in the Christian story. We are created by God in his image. We are unique and valuable as individuals. We rebelled against God, we call that sin, and broke our relationship with him and with each other. That is called the fall of humanity. We believe that we live in a disordered, fallen, corrupt world. Those are synonyms, however you wanna think about that. We need reconciliation with God to be whole. We are broken and we need to be restored. I'm just gonna use various words here because the Bible uses a lot of words in this story. We're broken, we need to be restored. We have corrupted the image of God within us and we need it to be uh, re refreshed within us. We have broken our relationship and departed from God, we need to reconcile with God. All those are ways of saying the essential healing that needs to happen for us to be whole, authentic, the way God made us to be. There's a brokenness that needs to be restored. Because he loves us, God reconciled us through Christ on the cross. This is called the gospel, this event. It's an event in history and it's a story. Through that event, he reconciled us to himself. Christ paid the price. Christ made it possible for us to be reconciled. Our old Self. This is unique to Christianity. Our old self, our corrupted, fallen self is dead and we live as new people in surrender and obedience to Christ. God is the author of truth and justice. There is such a thing as right and wrong. So these are some key ideas. The reason I picked some of these is that's the basic story, but also this is gonna be very different from some of the other worldviews, particularly the one we'll talk about in this lesson. We believe there is such a thing as truth. It's true all the time, it's true everywhere. It is unconditional truth. That's a unique thing in the Christian story compared to the Marxist story. We believe in individual worth. You are worth something, human dignity, human value, because God made you. We believe in justice as a thing outside of us. There are certain things that are just and there are certain things that are unjust. And it really doesn't matter when you lived. And it really doesn't matter your gender. It really doesn't matter the color of your skin. Or it doesn't matter how tall you are. Justice is an independent thing because God is the author of justice, not Terry. And finally, there is such a thing as morality. I wanna call that right and wrong. Outside of our self. In other words, there's not an action that is right for me to do, wrong for you to do. I can kill people, but you can't. In other words, there is a morality that comes from outside me and my preferences. These are some implications I just want you to hold in your thoughts of the Christian story. This is what Christians believe. This is how we understand the reality of the world to be. Does that make sense? That's pretty well known. So in our last lesson, we talked about these three gentlemen. Charles Darwin, I'll give you some basic ideas that are gonna run like a thread all the way up to the 21st century in a lot of uh, venues. Charles Darwin, evolution, but specifically, I don't like to talk about evolution. What I like to talk about is the idea of random mutations as an explanation of how every living thing got here, mutations by chance, and natural selection, and I'm gonna shorthand that to survival of the fittest. Those two ideas were groundbreaking ideas in the world of biology, okay? Everything got here by chance, random mutations, and how do you know which ones are gonna move on? Survival of the fittest. Interesting implication in that, life is a struggle. It's like watching a nature documentary. Lions eat antelopes, and that's the way it works, right? Survival of the fittest, survival of the fastest. Lions don't eat fast antelopes, they eat slow antelopes, right? 
So Nietzsche comes along, he's a philosopher. And he says, you know what? Darwin's right, there's actually a bigger idea here. All human beings, the basic impulse that you have is a will to power. Now when I say power, it sounds like a really abstract word. I want you to think about it as something as simple as getting your own way being able to tell other people what to do. I don't want power to be one of those abstract ideas, okay? It can be political power, it can be personal power, it can be physical power, might makes right, you know? That kind of a thing. Power can be good or bad. I mean, it's not inherently good or bad. For example, you have power over your two-year-old and when you say, do not touch the hot stove, that's a good use of power, isn't it? But then you look and you think subjugation of other peoples, conquest of other people's land and murdering them, well, that's power, but it's not a very good use of power. What Friedrich Nietzsche said is, it is survival of the fittest, and that is your basic urge. Neither one of these guys has a God. All there is is what you can see, and if it can't be explained by natural means in this material world, then it didn't happen. Needless to say, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in miracles, they don't believe in anything that can't be explained. So then along comes Karl Marx. So you've got the biologist, Darwin, with a groundbreaking idea. You've got the philosopher, Nietzsche, that says, hey, this idea is also true for just human behavior, human motivation. Then you get Karl Marx and he looks at his world and he says, you know what, this explains the economics, which economics actually doesn't just mean money. Economics means how you organize a society so that we can work together. I mean, somebody's gotta milk the cow, somebody's gotta grow the grain, somebody's gotta bake the bread. Economics or economy is really a word for that whole arrangement of human society. Does that make sense? It's not just the stock market. It's basically how do you run a society in such a way that everybody eats? right? Everybody can go to the hospital, whatever it may be. So Karl Marx said, you know what? I have observed that the way humans get along with each other, economics, is also Darwinian in the sense that there seem to be classes of people and they seem to be inevitably clashing with one another. And in fact, all of history, all of human history, he said, can be explained by the clash of different classes struggling with one another, class struggle, and that the only way to change this system is through revolution. So all of these gentlemen take the same fundamental idea, and I'm gonna summarize that story that they all have in different spheres, one of them in biology, one of them in human psychology and philosophy, and one of them in economics. And here is the modern secular story. And I call this social or cultural Marxism. And the reason is that fundamental idea that these gentlemen had applied to the way you understand the world is the modern secular religion. And when I say secular, I mean, for our purposes, not Christian, not Jewish, not Muslim, okay? You're, I don't basically believe in God. I believe in evolution. Yeah, it's kind of survival of the fittest. And life can be defined as the struggle between different groups of people. Here, the basic storyline of what's called social or cultural Marxism. We each belong to intersecting groups of oppressors or oppressed, well, right there, you see a basic fundamental assumption in this story, is you are either an oppressor or you are an oppressed. And in fact, all of life can be understood as the struggle between will to power, right? Nietzsche, and that is, I wanna be in charge and you wanna be in charge and all of our life is about who gets to be in charge, right? This believes that you belong to a group of people and our identity is found in our group. Let me give you an example. I'm trying to think of examples that aren't incendiary because I'm not really trying to comment on this. I'm trying to make sense of this. So for example, I am male, so that's one of the groups that I'm in, and traditionally males have not treated females very well historically. I mean, make less money, 
uh, have been considered property in, in a lot of cultures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm in the oppressor class. If you're female, you're in the oppressed class. Does that mean anything? Now, I wanna make sure you understand. Does that mean I've oppressed anybody? Does that mean if you are a woman listening to me that you have been oppressed? No, this is not about individuals. Remember, this story is about classes or groups of people. That's key to understand. That this story is about groups, classes, the struggle between groups of people. Not which individual lion is gonna survive, is which, let's go back to Darwin, what mutations will make lion kind survive? Does that make sense? This story, individuals aren't in this story. Nobody loves you. I just want you to know that, okay? That's a hard fact of life. Okay, so I'm in the male class. I also happen to have a kind of white skin. So I'm a white guy. Well, it turns out that historically, white people have at some points oppressed a lot of people. Other white people, people of color, whatever, all right? Sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't, sometimes they've been oppressed, but bottom line, I'm an oppressor. I have intersecting classes, white, male. So I'm an oppressor two times over, okay? Intersect, this is called intersectionality. Suppose you're female, so you're in a class or group of people. I'm not making fun of this, this is this worldview story. This is how they think about it. And let's say I'm a Hispanic woman. Well, Hispanics haven't always been uh, at the top of the pecking order, right, in society throughout history, and neither have women. So I'm intersecting as a woman of color, right? And so thereby, I intersect in an oppressed class. And so the, this story says we belong to these groups and our identity is found in the group not as an individual. In other words, I may not have oppressed you. You may not have been oppressed. You may be the exception to whatever rule we're talking about. That's not the point, okay? It's important to understand that if you wanna understand events. Second, the conflict between groups is inevitable and necessary. In fact, if you are in an oppressed group, you must revolt and overthrow the group that is oppressing you. That's Darwinian in a biological sense. If you wanna to go to the top of the food chain, you gotta knock off the people, you gotta kill the lions, okay? If you want to be the ruling class, you gotta knock off whoever's ruling. In whatever country you are, there are different ruling groups and classes of people. In other words, as Marx said, it's an inevitable clash between the classes and the only way to change that is revolt. Give you a great example of this. I'm gonna switch back to race issues in the United States to make an, an illustration. Malcolm X, whom I talked to you about last week and gave you uh, a line on, on the best, in my view, the best biography, autobiography of Malcolm X. He said this, he said, freedom never comes peacefully. He's talking about racial change, okay, one area, but what's he saying? He's saying, this is his story. This is fundamentally the story that he's living out in his worldview. You read the autobiography, you'll see, yeah, absolutely. This is what he, what he believed. This was his worldview. And that is that there is a struggle, it's inevitable, and the only way to make change is revolution, okay? Freedom doesn't come peacefully. We talked about critical theory, not just critical race theory, but critical theory. Remember, critical theory said, not only when you get into a, a place of oppression or discrimination, it's not enough just to stop the discrimination. All of the organs of society are supportive of that oppressor class. So you not only need to get whoever the oppressor is, whatever group is oppressing you. You not only need to get them to stop thinking that way, stop doing that, you need to get rid of the legal system, the social institutions, and everything else. For example, Malcolm X wasn't a Christian. At first, this is one reason I have respect for him, by the way. Uh, we don't agree on worldviews, but I have some respect for him. He was part of the Nation of Islam at first, and he left the Nation of Islam, and that's why he was killed, when he found that that was not true. He had real issues with that. But my point is, is that he blamed 
Christian pastors, black Christian pastors, as being part of the problem. And I'll tell you why later. So the idea is, is that you cannot peacefully change this balance of power. Darwin believed that. That's why nature is the, the law of tooth and claw. Have you ever heard that saying? The law of tooth and claw, meaning might makes right. The lions win, the gazelles don't, you know, that kind of a thing. Same thing Nietzsche said, same thing Marx is gonna say, revolt. And finally, truth claims are instruments of oppression. This is what drives you nuts when you listen to the news. It's because this worldview says there is no such thing as absolute truth. What you say, if you happen to be in one of the oppressor classes, and let's just assume for tonight you're all oppressors. All right, this would be easier. So you're all oppressors. Anything you say is merely trying to reinforce your power. So for example, if you said, here's a great one. If you said, hey, I'd love to see the facts to establish what you're saying. Whoa, 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 what an absolutely oppressive thing to say. In other words, you will hear statements like, I don't care about the facts because I am morally right. You have heard this from United States political people who live out this story. And my point is not to make fun of this, my point is to say, whatever you say in this story is assumed to be manipulative. Does that make sense? Every speech, all speech, is an attempt to gain power. Ugly, but that's the view. Justice is whatever serves the group. That's why double standards, what you and I would call a double standard, is like, well, wait a minute. It's okay if this person does it, and it's not okay if that person does it? Yeah. There's no such thing as a justice outside that. It all depends on who's doing it and what the rationale for doing it is, okay? And then finally, morality serves the interest of the group. There's no such thing as a fixed right and wrong, okay? That is summarizing this story. And we spent a lot of time last time on it, and I wanted to hit it again because the basis of that undergirds the social and cultural ideology story that's prevalent in our society. And in a minute, I'm gonna to go to the economic story, which is built on the same basic foundational principles. So let me pause for a minute. How can we clarify that? Is the constitutional principle of equal justice under the law uh, in deference to justice as you describe it here? Yes, great question. Is the Constitution, we're talking about the U.S. Constitution, is the U.S. constitutional commitment, whether or not it's been lived out, let's leave that aside for a minute, this is an ideal in the U.S. Constitution of equal justice under the law. The U.S. Constitution, whether, I'm not gonna argue about the founders, but this is inarguable. This country was founded on people who lived the Christian story. Makes sense? I'm not telling you everybody was a great Christian. Some will say, well, some of them were deists. Doesn't matter, leave that aside. You cannot argue that when you read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, it is coming out of the Christian story. It is assumed in our Constitution that there is such a thing as justice and that it can be applied to everybody, quote, equally, meaning fairly, meaning everybody gets justice. I'm, I'm not talking about did people live that out well. No, they did not always. But the question is, that is not coming from this story. If Marxists wrote a Constitution, do you know what it would look like? Oh, hey, there are some good examples. China, Russia, do not have that in their founding principles. Does that make sense? So yes, that is in our constitution. It is consistent with the worldview or the life story of our founders. It was the Christian story. Good question. How does that compare to your statement that justice is whatever serves the group? How does that compare to my statement that justice is whatever serves the group? In this story, social, cultural Marxism, this is not the story that wrote the Constitution. 
People that believe this story do not like the Constitution, do not agree with the Constitution. So for example, I'm trying to think of something, again, non-incendiary. I really don't want us getting wrapped up in the examples. The point is, if you want to understand what's happening, is for example, we would argue, I'm trying to, like I say, I'm trying to think of something that's, that we don't get off into the example and just get all revved up about that. There are, sometimes there are people who do, well, let me use affirmative action. That's probably as marginal as I can. Affirmative action is a policy that says we will favor certain groups of people for say college admission over other groups of people. That's fundamentally a violation of the idea of equal justice for all, equal access for all. And so affirmative action was not part of the US Constitution it's not really contemplated in, in other words, it's legal discrimination. But before you think that's bad, let me explain to you. So that's not really part of our history or our laws. But when you look at this story and you say, and this part is very true, there has been discrimination against people in America. We have not lived out that story. And so to make that right, it's only just that we discriminate the other direction. I'm not arguing for or against, I'm giving you an example of how discrimination against certain people is bad, discrimination against certain other people is okay. Again, I'm not trying to make anybody mad, I'm just describing the way it is, but I want you to understand in this story, that's perfectly sensible. In the Christian story, that's not what we would call justice, now you may still favor it for various other reasons. I just wanna point out the difference. There's a great example where you don't treat people the same, okay? And you might say, but, 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 yes, but there are reasons for it here and there are reasons not to do it on the other side. I'm not arguing about that, I'm just saying it exists. So justice is a different concept depending on which story you're in. In the intersectionality story, are Christians seen as an oppressive or oppressed group or neither one? Yeah, good question. When it comes to intersectionality and identity groups, are Christians considered to be oppressors, oppressed, or neither one? In this story, so let's go put on our little hat, our Marxist hat, typically Christians are thought of as oppressors. And I'll explain that in just a minute when we get into the economic side. So let's go into that for a minute. So now I'm gonna leave the social aspects of Marxism and of the Marxist story, the Marxist idea, the Marxist belief system. And I just wanna show you what it looks like when you go from social to economic. I showed you this last time, the two great examples of Marxist story, the Marxist idea being lived out are Russia and China because they both had successful revolutions. And in other words, if you think about Mao Zedong, I'm just gonna talk about Mao as kind of the founder of modern China. And then on the le bottom left, you see Lenin, the ball guy, and you see Stalin, who's sitting beside him. Lenin led a revolution, didn't he, against the czars in Russia. Why did he do that? He knew that the only way to overcome the class struggle was to overthrow the power, and he did killed the czar, right? Killed his kids, etc., and took over. Mao did the same thing, was able to successfully revolt during World War II and acquire power and control of China. They lived out the Marxist story in those two countries and they successfully overturned the power structure. So they are examples of the Marxist story. So let's talk about two ideas that I just wanna give us a little clarity around. Let's talk about what is uh, socialism. Socialism assumes two major classes. Are you hearing the Marxist story? Two groups, two classes. Those who control the means of production and those who provide the labor to create the products and services. This is the essential Marxist project. He said through all of history can be understood this way. 
When people organize themselves, you've got a class of people that own the means of production. In other words, I own the tractor. Then you have people who are the labor, who use the tractor, hoe the land, and do that to make the goods and services. Those two are inevitably clashing with one another, right? And so it's unfair, it's open impressive that I'm getting rich just because I own a tractor. I'm not even doing much. And you are working yourself to death. I don't know how I got to be the oppressor in this, but anyway, all right, I'll be the oppressor. For this. But you are working yourself to death as a day laborer and barely making it by, and that's not right. Consequently, you're gonna revolt and take my tractor. That's socialism, all right? so. Socialism assumes you have two classes and socialism advocates for the social control of the means of production, which there are a lot of flavors of socialism. And for those of you out there that are going, okay, wait a minute, what about marketplace socialism? What about social socialism? What about governmental socialism? There are a lot of flavors. I'm just gonna distill it down to the basic idea. Two classes of people, the haves, the have nots, right? Labor, owners of, labor, of the means of production. Socialism says, we need to have everybody owning the means of production and everybody sharing, specifically in the form of a government doing it. All the socialist countries you know have some form of governmental control of the means of production. So for example, it could be nationalizing industries, right? So you think about healthcare, great example. Healthcare, in certain countries, the government runs it. Doctors, nurses, etc., work for the government, which is theoretically all of us. You understand it doesn't actually work out that way, but that's what socialism is basically. Socialized medicine, socialism and medicine. The means of giving those services are owned by us, meaning the government, okay? That's why the Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare, was seen as a step towards socialism because it was a move, and this is just a fact, it was a move. Now you may say it was a good move, you may say it was a bad move, I'm not arguing that, but it was a move toward a socialized form of medicine. So that may be the one people know best. That's socialism. Now, who are the bad guys in this? Oh my gosh, the capitalists are the worst. As long as we're here, I might as well tell you about the capitalists. Capitalists, don't think there are classes of people. Capitalists think everybody's an individual and they believe in individual ownership of whatever you can work hard and own. Well, that is as bad as it gets for a socialist. That is as unfair as it gets. And there are some very legitimate uh, critiques of capitalism involving, and historically can involve great deal of oppression. Now you may say, yeah, Terry, there's also some unbelievable examples of socialism involving oppression. Guess what? Let me, can I slip back to the Christian story? That's called fallen humanity. Doesn't make any difference if you own the tractor or you don't own the tractor, you're a fallen human being and you need Jesus Christ. Okay, now I'm gonna step back into this story. So socialists say we need social control of the means of production. Marx saw this as an intermediate step to communism. Communism also, first sentence is the same, assumes two major classes, those who control the means of production, those who provide the labor to actually create products and services of value. But communism advocates for common ownership, not governmental ownership, common ownership of the means of production. The elimination of the state of, of a country and the elimination of classes. That's what got implemented in the Soviet Union, I'm just gonna call it Russia. Russia in 1918, that's what got implemented under Mao in the late 1940s in China. Why, you ask, knowing what we know about history, that is assuming that you are not a millennial and they actually taught you this stuff, I'm sorry, that was a millennial slur. That was actually on the school system. That wasn't on you. But my point is, if you know any history, you realize this was ugly. More people died under communist regimes in the 20th century 
than probably throughout all of human history through violence. I mean, unbelievable. But that's not how they pitched it. Mao didn't say, hey, vote for me. I'm going to do communism and millions of you, I mean, tens of millions of you are going to die. Well, no, that's not what he said. Marx said communism is a utopia and every teenager believes in it. There's something inside us that wants to say, look, can't we all just get along? Can't we just share? And then you look at your two-year-old and go, no, obviously we cannot. And then you become a Christian because you see fallen humanity. Okay, two-year-olds are God's way of saying, you dudes are fallen humanity, all right? You are not gonna get along. But my point, all, all joking aside, is this was a utopia. That's why communism was very popular in the 40s. A lot of people were saying we need a communist regime because then we're gonna treat everybody the same. We're gonna treat everybody fairly. Well, let me tell you what happened. So this is the story, okay? Here's what happened. It turns out, this is one of those things where communism turns into a bit of a myth. There's some things that are true in communism. Oh, oppression, absolutely. Man's inhumanity to man over gender, color, you name it. We'll, we'll treat each other bad for almost any reason you can think of. That's true. The problem with this story, and nobody's living out the communist story right now, okay? Those two countries, I'll tell you what they're living out, but it isn't the communist story. Because the communist story got tried and millions and millions of people died. In Russia, what did they do? Collective farms. This is a little history lesson if you don't know this, but in the, uh, after 1918, they had collective farms, and they said everybody works. Doctor gets paid the same as the field worker. In other words, to each according to his need, this is the communist creed, and from every according to his ability. So if you happen to be really smart, you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna go out and doctor people. And if you happen to have a strong back and you, know, you can go work in the fields, well, that's what you contribute and everybody gets the same thing. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking about this, you're going, what is wrong with this story? That's the mythical part of communism. And I'm not trying to bash it, I'm just telling you the historical reality. Even the communists figured out that, you know what, if you don't pay people extra for working harder, they won't work harder. God, what a blinding flash of the obvious. Well, but people put this into practice and tens of millions of people died of hunger. I'm not talking about the violence now. I'm talking about unbelievable amount of people in Russia and China died of hunger because it doesn't work. So, I mean, that's just the facts, historical facts. So China and Russia today are not communist countries. Does that make sense? It didn't work. They are authoritarian countries they are very strong socialist countries, right? The People's Republic of China, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, you know Vladimir Putin was elected. So you do have a government that represents the people. Now, most of you think, if you think our election was stolen, that's a joke, okay? But it is theoretically you have legitimacy by being the authoritarian government and controlling the means of production for the good of the people as a class, not necessarily the good of people as individuals. Okay, so this is the Marxist story playing itself out. The communist piece didn't work, but the socialist piece is alive and well. That's where income, for you and I think of this as income redistribution. That's probably the biggest socialist little tenet that you see in America. The idea that we got the 1% making too much money, and that may be true. I'm not arguing the morality of this at the moment, I'm explaining this story. You got 1% got way more money than everybody else. You got people down here working hard. Does this sound like the people that own the means of production and the people that are the labor? Yes, it is. People down here working real hard and barely making a living, you know what we need to do? We need to take some of their money and we need to give it to them. Okay, you may agree with that. If you're in this story, you definitely agree with that. That's income redistribution. That's a very socialist idea. And when I say that, I don't say it with any malice or anything negative. I'm saying that's this story, okay? You're saying, well, Terry, Christians care about poor people too. Yes, and the Christian answer is you give them your money. That's the Christian story. You go help feed the poor. 
Socialist story is, you go feed the poor, not me, okay? Margaret Thatcher, by the way, this is just funny, okay? Margaret Thatcher is famous for saying this, and this is, so, this is just so on. She said, the problem with socialism is as sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And that's the idea of socialism, is taking and redistributing. The Christian story says, well, whatever you have, give some of what you have to others. That's very different. You see the difference in the two stories? Again, I'm not arguing, one's right, one's wrong. Some of you may live out this story and I'm not trying to be negative about it. I'm just trying to tell you what it is. Okay, so a couple of things that play themselves out. I wanna use Russia and I wanna use China as an example of playing out some of these Marxist ideologies. And one of those ideas is expansion. If you think about it, one of the Marxist ideas is life is a struggle. Whether you're Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, life is a struggle. Marxist economies, Marxist countries, because I don't wanna say communist because they're actually more of a modified socialism, authoritarian kind of socialism, are imperialistic. Why? It's a dog eat dog world. Either the whole world's communist or we got a problem. So Russia becomes the Soviet Union. And so you see Russia today used to be more than this when it, it fell because communism as an economic system didn't work. The Chinese see this smart cookies and say, we better tweak this deal so that we can stay in power. And so they modified into a modified kind of socialism. And then you see China and both of them are expansionist. They see things as a struggle, a struggle against the West, the Cold War. Think about today, who are the top two threats? And this is true whether, I don't care if you're a Democrat, I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care what political party, I don't care if you're in the Green Party, anybody looking at the world today thinks, and you'll see by the way, the Biden administration is taking this same line towards Russia and China. What are the two greatest threats nationally to the United States and the world today, China and Russia. Why? Because we wanna take them over? No, we really don't. They're big fixer-uppers, okay? We do not want to buy that property. They are expansionist. And, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to point fingers, I'm just telling you the way it is. So here's Russia, different map. And so what you've seen is, you see the Crimea right here? Took that over. See the Ukraine right there? That little yellow place, that's the separatist movement of Ukrainians trying to overthrow the Ukraine. Guess where they're getting their money and their weapons? Russia. Russia is expanding into what are called the Balkans. I'll show you another map in a second. You'll know what those countries are. And back into the former Soviet Union satellites. Let me show you a little different map. This is a NATO map, but forget that. This is the Balkans, all those countries that you, you, you've heard the name, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Albania, Croatia, Slovenia, it's like, yeah, I mean, those are great things to know for Scrabble, but other than that, you have no idea where they are. Now you know where they are, they're called the Balkans. Then you have like Ukraine, which Russia's in the process of taking over. You have Crimea, which they have. In other words, Russia, all my point is, Russia is expansionist, Russia is imperialistic. Russia would like to take over the world. And I'm not saying that that makes, again, I'm not making a value judgment. I don't happen to like that. I mean, I want you to doubt my, my morals here, but the point is that's part of their worldview. If you are Vladimir Putin and you believe this story, you probably do what Vladimir Putin does. And don't kid yourself into saying, you know, Vlad's really a good guy. No. Vlad may be a good guy, may be a bad guy. He might be nice to his dog and he might treat his wife well, but Vlad is going to expand and conquer other people because that's his worldview. China, same thing. It's on the same idea that there's always a struggle between civilizations. Huntington, Samuel Huntington wrote a great book called The Clash of Civilizations. It's a classic. Uh, and it, it describes this idea that there are civilizational classes. Remember, Marx said there were gonna be clashes between economic groups. Well, Marx has fallen out of favor because that communism thing didn't work out too well, but the ideas are still there, and so there's a clash of civilizations and organization. 
And so, for example, you'll see on the news, China, Chinese are really smart politicians. They, there is this international law that says you have territorial waters, so 14 miles off your coast is yours. That's just true for every nation. And then you have an exclusive economic zone of 200 miles. It's a long story about what that actually means. So what do the Chinese do? They say, actually, this whole area, the South China Sea, that's ours. It's our territory. And everybody else goes, no, it's not. And they go, oh yeah, it is. You know why? I'm building little islands. You guys read about this in the news? It's been going on for quite a while. China's building artificial islands all over the South China Sea. Said, I got 14 miles around that one. I got 14 miles around that one. I got 14 miles around that one. In other words, this is going to be my area. Expansionist. China, as you know, economically, really putting the squeeze on all of these Asian countries around here, making them economic vassals, if you will, economically dependent on them. So my point there is one of the things that you see in the dog-eat-dog -dog survival of the fittest world economically is expansionism is part of this story. Let me pause. What, uh, what questions do we have? How do China and Russia justify the oligarchs within their countries? Yeah, this is getting, the question is how do Russia and China justify the oligarchs in their countries? This is getting a little granular. Remember when I said communism didn't work and so they live in a kind of a tweaked version of socialism that's very authoritarian, a lot of command and control, but they let in just enough market driven forces to keep the people a little happier than they used to be when they had bread lines and not enough to eat when communism failed. Here's the short version of that. Oligarchs are an unpleasant side effect of opening up the markets a little bit and having a lot of corruption. So it's not really part, they don't like that very well, but it's, it's actually a bit of a side effect of trying to make a little bit of a marriage between a little bit of capitalism so that we don't have the failure of communism, okay? Probably not the world's greatest answer, but think about that. that that's what oligarchs are. They're an unpleasant side effect. So is Russia's current expansion just a do-over as socialism, considering all of those countries were a part of the USSR when communism failed? I think I heard the question right. There's not a mic, there's not a uh, speaker up here where I can hear. I think you said, is Russia expansionist trying to take over the countries they used to have? Yes, the Soviet Union used to include all the stands. Kyrgyzstan, Turkestan, all, you know, all those countries used to be part of the Soviet Union. They're not anymore, want to take them over again. They, it fell when communism failed economically. And so then it all breaks up. Now comes, same story, Vladimir Putin. Honestly, if you, if you want to look at it, the guy is a really powerful leader. I feel like I'm saying that and I'm going to get slammed. But the point is, he's a really good leader. I don't think he's a good guy, but he's a really good leader because he's gotten his country with a nationalist idea, Mother Russia, right? Nationalist pride, which is a way for socialism to rally its people together and let's go expand and make Russia great again. I mean, that's kind of what's happening here. So yes, they are expanding and they won't stop with those nations. And I'm, I'm telling you that just to say, you should expect this. You pick up the paper and you read, Russia is undermining the stability of their neighboring countries. Oh my, what a shock, not even slightly. That's part of this story, right? Okay, so expansionism, survival of the fittest. China, Russia intend to be the fittest. Second thought, let's talk about religion for a minute. This, you've heard that Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses, but this is actually what he said. He said, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature. He's, now remember him, he's thinking czars and peasants, brutal class distinctions. The heart of a heartless world and the soul of a soulless conditions. Religion is the opium of the people. Karl Marx didn't believe in God and he thought it was bad. He thought Christianity, he thought all religion, by the way, is bad. Why? Because religion 
keeps the oppressed people content with their oppressed condition. When Christian story comes in and says, this world is not all there is, and you may suffer for a period in this life, in fact, everyone will suffer for a period in this life, and there is something greater and beyond this world. And if you think about the early church, early Christians, they were not in anybody's oppressor class. They were definitely oppressed and almost extinguished, right? They killed Christians. So they were oppressed. Did they believe this story? The only way for us to succeed is to take up our arms and overthrow the Roman Empire. No, they didn't. They said, our God is greater than that. And it turned out to be true. Marx goes, forget this God nonsense. All I know is Christianity and other religions tell people you shouldn't be out killing other people when in fact we need to kill a bunch of these people that are ruling us. So religion in general was considered a way of keeping oppressed people finding meaning or happiness in their oppression and they wouldn't revolt. And so Marx was very much against that. Malcolm X, as opposed to, by the way, and again, I don't mean to keep getting into race, but we know this story. Martin Luther King was operating out of the Christian story. And what he said was, we will change this country. We will get America to be true to her founding principles, and we will do it without killing people. Malcolm X said, there is no justice. There is no freedom peacefully, and that's why he was so critical of Martin Luther King and critical of Christian clergy, all clergy, but Christian clergy, because he said, you make people endure suffering. I want them to raise up and overthrow them. So they're operating out of two different stories. Does that make sense? I want you to understand why it's happening. They're operating out of these two different stories. So let me pause there for a minute, because I want to go into the third thing. So religion is a bad thing in this story. And in America, by the way, you notice there's more and more pressure on religion. Instead of being loving people, you're haters. If you are Islam and you don't affirm homosexuality, let's say, because traditional Islam does not, you are bad. If you're Christian and you believe in loving your neighbor and you're great citizens, that's nice. But if you don't happen to agree on this thing, then you're bad. In general, in this story, social Marxism, economic Marxism, religion is a bad thing. And that leads to one other issue. But before I go there, is there a question about this? Um, sort of. What is the difference between socialist countries like Russia and China and other socialist countries like Sweden, Norway, Argentina? Yeah, this one, I may not have time to give you as good an answer as you deserve on this. So what is the difference between socialist countries like uh, Russia and China and socialist countries like, Arge I mean, a lot of socialist countries, a lot of quasi-socialist countries, like Scandinavian countries. Scandinavian countries are like, those are the good socialists. They didn't murder tens of millions of people. And that is true. They did not murder tens of millions of people. There are di Remember when I said there are different flavors of socialism? And it's also kind of unique because, for example, China is not governed quite the same way as Russia. They have the same foundational principles, and that is you're not an individual, you're a member of the class, you're a Russian, or you are Mandarin. You know, you're a class of people. They have some same foundations, and life is a struggle, and it's survival of the fittest. So they have a lot of that in common, but the way they implement the authoritarian rule, the socialism, is a little bit different. The Scandinavian countries specifically have implemented socialism in a less authoritarian way. Um, that, let's leave it at that. They've implemented socialism in a less authoritarian way. They do not necessarily ascribe to all the tenets of this story. So uh, that'll have to be good enough for that. So they, they are socialists, they, they implement it in a little different way. It's not quite as authoritarian, but if you moved there, you would feel like it was very authoritarian compared to the USA. So it's a, it's a matter of relativity. So here's the interesting thing about religion, and this is one of the things I wanna leave you with about this story. 
and because it's a harbinger of everywhere this story goes, this happens. Robert Mounts, Christian commentator, said this really well. He said, lack of respect for God, or eliminating God. Nietzsche said God is dead. Mao is not just an atheist, but stamping out religion. It is hard to be a Christian in China. It is hard to be a Christian in Russia. It's hard, it's really dangerous to be a Muslim in China, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, when you leave out God, lack of respect to God leads to a lack of justice for people. History demonstrates that nations that forsake God lose their concern for the rights of the individual. That is historically true, but that is an absolutely endemic, uh, baked in part of this story because individuals do not figure in this story. It's about classes. Individuals don't do well in this story. You leave out God, what were one of the tenets of the Christian story? You matter because you're made in God's image. Darwin says, you aren't made in anybody's image. If anything, you're made in the image of an orangutan. Okay, I'm joking, but you get my point. And you are an accident. You're the result of random mutations. You're not special, I'm sorry to tell you that. No one loves you. You're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. Okay, so that's a Darwinian story, right? So when you, when you get into this story, they lose their concern for the rights of individuals. To forsake God is to forsake his creatures as individuals. As a national policy, atheism grinds its people under the collective heel of what's best for society. That is absolutely what you see happening in the stories that live this way. We care about people, but I don't care about individuals. You'll see that all over. The, those in, the, in America who are living this secular story out, you'll see that all the time. We care about people, but we don't care about you. And in fact, you only have an identity insofar as the group you're part of. But I didn't do anything, doesn't matter, okay? So he's absolutely right. And I'm gonna give you two great examples. This is an iconic picture. This is, this guy's got a name. Nobody knows who he is. Uh, he disappears from history, snatched up by the police. He's called Tank Man, because nobody knows who he is. But in 1989, in Tiananmen Square, this guy, he's got two shopping bags, and he's on his way home, and he sees the tanks coming, and he stands in front of the tanks. This is an iconic picture of two stories colliding. He is an individual, and the tanks are the state, and they are gonna run over the individual. And that is the story of these uh, Marxist story. This Marxist story, individuals get run over. This is an iconic photo. The West said, look at the injustice here. You don't care about this individual. And the East said, it's all about the good of the people. It's all about the good of society. It's all about the good of the masses. China, it's happening today. There is a group of people called Uyghurs uh, I spell it U-I-G-H-U-R. They are an ethnic group of people who are Muslims, ethnically Muslim. They live in Xinjiang province. And you'll see on this map that I stole from Council on Foreign Relations, uh, there are somewhere between 27 and 1200 re-education camps. These people have been taken from their jobs. The adults are stuck in camps, you see a picture, to be re-educated, meaning you can't be religious and we're gonna tell you the Marxist story and you're gonna believe it. They separated their kids from them and they're gonna raise their kids to believe that story. This is, you look at that and you and I say, boy, if you wanna define unjust and look it up in the dictionary, you got a picture of this. And in China, they're like, if you get inside my story, this is completely legitimate. I'm just doing what's best for most people. I can't have these rabble-rousing Muslims disturbing our unity. Do you understand what I'm saying? When in, you're inside this story, this is just. You get in the Christian story, you go, you can't treat people that way. I mean, we don't think that's just. If we do it, it's unjust. It's unjust for anybody to do it. But that is an inevitable part of this story. Let me leave you with this thought. In America, when Christians own slaves. That was a betrayal of the Christian story. 
in the Marxist story, when people are treated like the Uyghurs are treated, that is the natural outcome of the Marxist story. Do you understand what I'm saying? You may say, and a lot of people will, yeah, well, your Christian story, bad things have happened there, bad things have happened here. Six of one, half dozen of the other, right? The Christian story, to a certain extent, the American story, injustice is a betrayal of that story, and it's wrong, and we admit that it's wrong, we need to repent of its wrongness. In the Marxist story, that's normal. That is inevitable. That's probably the biggest difference between those two stories that I could point out. Make sense? Good, I hope that's kind of clear because in our next lesson, we're gonna add a third story and we're gonna bring the Jews in and let's just visit the Middle East and see how it's going over there. So that's what we'll do next time. Thanks guys.